It's usually impossible or impractical for a researcher to observe every individual in a population. Therefore, researchers usually collect data from a sample and then use the sample data to help answer questions about the population. The purpose of research is often to determine the effect of a treatment or manipulation. In other words, the goal is to determine what happens to the population after the treatment is administered. The unknown population is hypothetical, in the sense that the treatment is never administered to the entire population. Instead we're asking, what if that were to happen? We can combine the concepts of z-scores, probability and the distribution of sample means to create a new statistical procedure known as a hypothesis test. This is a statistical method that uses sample data to evaluate a hypothesis about a population. It's one of the most commonly used inferential procedures. A hypothesis is a proposed explanation made in the basis of limited evidence as a starting point for further investigation. The process of hypothesis testing begins by stating a hypothesis about the unknown population. Actually, we state two opposing hypotheses, both in terms of population parameters. The first and most important is called the null hypothesis, which states that the treatment had no effect. In other words, there was no change, no difference, nothing happened, hence the name null. The null hypothesis is identified by the symbol H0. In the context of an experiment, the null hypothesis predicts that the independent variable, i.e. the treatment, had no effect on the dependent variable for the population. In the context of an experiment, the null hypothesis predicts that the independent variable, i.e. the treatment, has no effect on the dependent variable for the population. The second hypothesis is simply the opposite of the null, and it's called the alternative hypothesis, with the symbol notation H1. This hypothesis states that the treatment effect does have an effect on the dependent variable. So in the context of an experiment, the alternative hypothesis predicts that the independent variable does have an effect on the dependent variable. It may seem awkward that the null hypothesis is first and most important, after all, the purpose of most experiments is to show that a treatment does have an effect and the null hypothesis states that there is no effect. The reason for focusing on the null hypothesis is that logically it's much easier to demonstrate that a population hypothesis is false than to demonstrate that it's true. For example, suppose you make the universal statement all dogs have four legs, every single one. You intend to test this hypothesis by using a sample of 10 dogs. If all the dogs in your sample do have four legs, have you proven your statement? It should be clear that 10 four-legged dogs do not prove this statement to be universally true. On the other hand, suppose one unfortunate dog in your sample has only three legs. In this case, you've easily and clearly proven the statement all dogs have four legs to be false. In short, it's much easier to show that something is false than to prove that it's true. Depending on the type of research and the type of data, the details of the hypothesis test change from one research situation to another. That said, a hypothesis test is a formalised procedure that follows a standard series of operations. These four basic elements are common to all hypothesis tests. In this way, researchers have a standardised model for evaluating the results of their studies. Other researchers will recognise and understand exactly how the data were evaluated and how conclusions were reached. Step 1. The hypothesis is stated in terms of a population parameter, and we assume that all hypothesis is true unless there's sufficient evidence to reject it. So for example, the average coffee drinker in the US consumes a mean of 3.1 cups of coffee daily with a standard deviation of 0.9. But what about people who study or work in coffee shops? Do they drink different amounts? The null and alternative hypotheses for that research question are as follows. The null hypothesis states that people who sit and work in a coffee shop 
drink a mean of 3.1 cups of coffee. In other words, the null hypothesis is saying that studying or working in a coffee shop has no effect on your daily consumption. Whereas the alternative hypothesis says that it does. That people who sit and work in a coffee shop have a mean that's not equal to 3.1 cups. Maybe they drink more, maybe they drink less. But it's not the same. There are always two possible explanations for patterns that appear in the sample data obtained from a research study. Firstly, the pattern was caused by some systematic factor and therefore represents a real, meaningful event. Or secondly, the pattern is simply the result of random influences or chance occurrences and it's not meaningful. The dilemma for researchers is trying to distinguish between these two alternatives. A hypothesis test helps researchers differentiate between real and random patterns by first determining what kind of patterns might reasonably be produced by random factors. If the sample pattern falls into this category, the researchers must conclude that it has no significance. On the other hand, if the pattern does not fall into the randomly produced category, the researchers can conclude that the pattern is not random, but rather represents a significant and meaningful pattern in the population. To visualise this, let's consider the distribution of sample means if the null hypothesis is true, and let's divide this distribution into two sections. The middle section represents all the sample means that are very likely to be obtained if the null hypothesis is true, whereas the two smaller tails represent the sample means that are very unlikely to be obtained if indeed the null hypothesis is true. The extreme values in the tails of the distribution define outcomes that are not consistent with the null hypothesis. To find the boundaries that separate the high probability samples from the low probability samples, we must define what we mean by high and low. The alpha level or the level of significance is a probability value that's used to define the very unlikely sample outcomes that would be obtained if indeed the null hypothesis is true. The extremely unlikely values, as defined by the alpha level, make up the critical region. We determine exact values for the boundaries of the critical region by using the alpha level we've chosen, for example 5% and the unit normal table. 5% divided between two critical regions is 2.5% each. 0 0.0250 in column C of the unit normal table gives us z-score values of plus or minus 1.96. These z-score values are the boundaries that identify the critical regions. When data from a research study produce a sample mean that's located in the critical region, we conclude that the data are not consistent with an null hypothesis and so we reject it. Step 3 in the process of hypothesis testing is where we would actually select a random sample and perform the experiment. If the mean from the sample data that we just collected is located in either of the critical regions, we reject the null hypothesis. We conclude that the data are not consistent with the idea that nothing meaningful happened. On the other hand, if our sample mean is not within a critical region, then we fail to reject the null hypothesis, and we conclude that the data are consistent with the idea that nothing meaningful happened. So the apparent difference between our sample mean and the population mean are simply due to random variations or chance occurrences. There's nothing systematic or meaningful behind it. Let's talk through a few examples. Example 1. Corn in Bloomington, Indiana grows to an average height of 72 inches with a standard deviation of 6, 5 months after it's planted. We want to study the effect of a fertilizer called Plant Food 6000 on corn growth. We randomly select a sample of N equals 40 seeds and treat them using PF6000 each week for 5 months. At the end of the 5 month period, our sample has a height of 75 inches. Is the height difference due to random variation in chance occurrences, so in other words, sampling error, or is it a true effect of our treatment with Plant Food 6000? Step 1. State the hypotheses. The null hypothesis says that corn treated with Plant Food 6000 for 5 months has a mean equal to 72 inches, 
In other words, the fertilizer has no effect. Whereas the alternative hypothesis says that corn treated with plant food 6,000 for five months is not equal to 72 inches. Maybe it's taller, maybe it's shorter. Step two, researchers themselves must choose an alpha level. Let's say we choose an alpha of 5%. So the critical regions are marked by the z-score values plus or minus 1.96. Step three, again, this is the part where we actually select the sample, conduct the experiment and calculate the sample mean. Step four, changing the sample mean into a z-score gives us a z-score value of 3.16. Our sample z-score of 3.16 exceeds the upper critical region boundary of 1.96. Therefore, we can reject the null hypothesis. The probability of obtaining a z-score of 3.16 is 0.08%, in other words, less than 5%. A special jargon and notation system are used in published reports of hypothesis testing. It's typical to see statements such as, the treatment with plant food 6000 has a significant effect on the growth of corn, z equals 3.16, with a p-value of less than 0.05. Example 2. There's some evidence that REM sleep, which is normally associated with dreaming, may also play a role in learning and memory. Smith and Lapp found increased REM activity for college students studying during exam periods. We randomly select a sample of n equals 16 students and measure their REM activity during the final exam period and get a sample mean of 143. REM activity for the college population averages 110, with a standard deviation of 50. So is the apparent difference in REM due to random variations and chance occurrences that are causing sampling error, or is it a true effect of the additional learning and memory associated with preparation for the final exams? Step 1. State the hypotheses. The null hypothesis says that REM activity during the final exam period has a mean of 110. In other words, preparing for final exams has no effect on the amount of REM activity that you have. Whereas the alternative hypothesis says that REM activity during the final exam period is not equal to 110. Maybe it's higher, maybe it's lower. Step 2. Again, the researcher must choose an alpha level. If we choose an alpha of 1%, then our critical regions are marked by the z-score boundaries of plus or minus 2.8. Again, step 3 is where we do the experiment and calculate our sample mean. And then step 4, we change that sample mean into a z-score. In this case, 2.64. Our sample z-score is 2.64. This exceeds the upper critical region boundary of z equals 2.58. Therefore, we can reject the null hypothesis that nothing happened. The probability of obtaining a z-score of 2.64 is 0.0041. In other words, it's less than 1%. To report our findings, we would say, studying for final exams has a significant effect on REM activity. Z equals 2.64 with a p-value of less than 0.01. Let's say that we had a sample z-score of 2.12. This does not exceed the upper critical region boundary of z equals 2.58. It's in the middle 95%. Therefore, we fail to reject an null hypothesis. Instead, we conclude that the apparent difference between the sample mean and the population mean is merely due to random variation or chance occurrences. In other words, sampling error. The probability of obtaining a z-score of 2.12 is 0 0.0170. In other words, it's greater than 1%. So we would report this finding by saying, studying for final exams had no significant effect on REM activity. Z equals 2.12 with a p-value greater than 0 0.01. In order to conduct hypothesis tests, we need to make four assumptions. Firstly, random sampling. It's assumed that the subjects used to obtain the data were selected randomly. Secondly, we assume that observations are independent. Events are independent if the occurrence of the first 
has no effect on the probability of the second event. This assumption is usually satisfied by using random sampling. Thirdly, we assume that the standard deviation for the unknown population is the same as the original population standard deviation. And lastly, we assume that the distribution of sample means has a normal shape in order to use the unit normal table. There are three factors that influence the outcome of a hypothesis test. The amount of difference between a treated sample mean and the original population mean. The variability of the scores. Higher variability can reduce the chances of finding a significant treatment effect. And the number of scores in the sample. In general, the larger the sample size, the greater the likelihood of finding a significant treatment effect. In statistical tests, a significant result, which is one with a p-value less than the alpha level, means that the null hypothesis has been rejected because the result is very unlikely to have occurred by chance. So a sample mean located within either of the critical regions produces a significant result. If the sample mean is not within a critical region, in other words in the middle 95%, then this produces an insignificant result. A hypothesis test may produce an erroneous result. Two types of errors can be made. The first, a type 1 error, occurs when a researcher rejects an null hypothesis that's actually true. So in other words, there's no real effect, nothing happened, the manipulation or the treatment did nothing, but the researcher is misled into thinking that there's an effect. The alpha level that we choose is the probability of committing a type 1 error. Remember, samples are not expected to be identical to their populations, and some extreme samples can be very different from the populations they're supposed to represent. If a researcher selects one of these extreme samples by chance, then the data from the sample may give the appearance of a strong treatment effect, even though there's no real effect. In this case, the researcher is likely to conclude that the treatment has had an effect, when in fact it really did not. You should realise that a type 1 error is not a stupid mistake in the sense that a researcher is overlooking something that should be perfectly obvious. On the contrary, the researcher is looking at sample data that appear to show a clear treatment effect. The researcher then makes a careful decision based on the available information. The problem is that the information from the sample is misleading. In most research situations, the consequences of a type 1 error can be very serious. Because the researcher has rejected the null hypothesis and believes that the treatment has a real effect, it's likely that the researcher will report or even publish the results. A type 1 error, however, means that this is a false report. Thus, type 1 errors lead to false reports in the scientific literature. Other researchers may try to build theories or develop other experiments based on the false reports based on the false results. A lot of precious time and resources may be wasted. A type 1 error occurs when a researcher unknowingly obtains an extreme, non-representative sample. Fortunately, the hypothesis test is structured to minimise the risk that this will occur. A type 2 error occurs when a researcher fails to reject an null hypothesis that's really false. In other words, our treatment or our manipulation really did do something but the researcher is misled into thinking that there's no effect. A type 2 error occurs when the sample mean is not in the critical region, even though the treatment has had an effect on the sample. Often this happens when the effect of the treatment is relatively small. In this case, the treatment does influence the sample, but the magnitude of the effect is not big enough to move the sample into the critical region. Because the sample is not substantially different from the original population, the statistical decision is to fail to reject the null hypothesis and to conclude that there is not enough evidence to say that there is a treatment effect. Unlike a type 1 error, it is impossible to determine a single exact probability value for a type 2 error. Instead, the probability of a type 2 error depends on a variety of factors and therefore is a function rather than a specific number. Nonetheless, the probability of a type 2 error is represented by the Greek letter beta.
The alpha level serves two important functions. It determines the boundaries for the critical region and it determines the probability of committing a type 1 error. Researchers consider alpha levels of 5%, 1% and 0.1% as reasonably good values because they provide a low risk of error without placing excessive demands on the research results. The hypothesis testing procedure we've learned so far was the standard or two-tailed test format. The term two-tailed comes from the fact that critical regions are located in both tails of the distribution. The two-tailed test is by far the most widely accepted procedure for hypothesis testing. However, there is an alternative. Usually a researcher begins an experiment with a specific prediction about the direction of the treatment effect. For example, Plant Food 6000 is expected to increase corn growth. In these situations, it's possible to state the statistical hypotheses in a manner that incorporates the directional prediction. The result is a directional test, or a one-tailed hypothesis test. In a one-tailed test, the statistical hypotheses specify either an increase or a decrease in the population mean score. That is, they make a statement about the direction of the effect. Let's go through an example. A physical therapist studies whether the use of robotic therapy devices can reduce the length of stay at an inpatient rehabilitation facility for stroke survivors with partial or one-sided paralysis. She randomly selects a sample of N equals 12 patients to have daily therapy with a lower limb device. Their mean length of stay was 14.6 days. Let's assume a mean of 18.7 days with a standard deviation of 7.8 for all inpatient rehabilitation facilities in the United States. So is the difference in the length of stay due to random variation or chance occurrences that result in sampling error, or is it a true effect of our manipulation with the robotic therapy device? Step 1. State the hypotheses. The null hypothesis says that daily robotic therapy does not decrease the length of stay for inpatient stroke survivors. They have a mean of greater than or equal to 18.7 days. Whereas the null hypothesis says that daily robotic therapy decreases the length of inpatient stay. They have a mean of less than 18.7 days. Step 2. Because this is a one-tailed test, and we're predicting a decrease, we have one critical region that's located in the left-hand tail. If we expected an increase for some reason, like with the plant food 6000, then we would have one critical region that's located in the right-hand tail. If we choose an alpha of 5%, then our critical region in the left-hand tail is marked by a z-score boundary of negative 1.65. Again, step 3 is where we do the experiment and calculate a sample mean based on our sample data. We would then convert that sample mean into a z-score, which in this case is negative 1.82. Our sample z-score of negative 1.82 exceeds the critical region boundary of negative 1.65. Therefore, we can reject the null hypothesis. The probability of obtaining a z-score of negative 1.82 is 0.0344. In other words, it's less than 5%. So we can report a result as daily robotic therapy decreases the length of stay for inpatient stroke survivors. Z equals negative 1.82 with a p-value of less than 0.05. The major distinction between one-tailed and two-tailed tests is the criteria they use for rejecting the null hypothesis. A one-tailed test allows you to reject the null hypothesis when the difference between the sample and the population is relatively small, provided the difference is in a specified direction. A two-tailed test, on the other hand, requires a relatively large difference independent of direction. When do we use one-tailed versus two-tailed tests? In general, use a two-tailed test when there is no strong directional expectation or when there are two competing predictions. You should use a one-tailed test only when the directional prediction is made before the research is conducted and there's a strong justification for making the directional prediction.
Never use a one-tail test as a second attempt to salvage a significant result from a failed two-tail test.